Since it was commissioned during the Civil War, freedom has stood watch over the capital of the United States. For most of her reign, she watched over a government controlled exclusively by men. In 1993, as she's returned to her post, the government is a much different place, changed in part by executive women in government. In the early 1970s, women were gaining power in the workforce, reaching positions of authority and responsibility. But they didn't seem to be moving into the decision-making levels of the federal government and the judiciary. President Richard Nixon wanted to tap the talents of America's professional women. President Nixon turned to Barbara Hackman Franklin for help. He wanted Franklin to recruit the best female talent available for appointments to key government positions. On September 20, 1973, they met to begin forming executive women in government. Founding members Franklin, Elizabeth Dole, and Jean Holm reminisce. Maybe it's the only, but it's certainly the first picture of women appointees in the Rose Garden that's ever yes. been taken. So this is a little piece of history right here. Wow. Oh, okay. this picture really brings back memories. Do you recall that, Dan? Indeed, I do. Yeah. And look at that. I mean, this is one that I'd like to hide. Well, my hair is this big. We all, oh, have, close. We all have blue long hair and yes. short skirts. We hiked right. our short skirts up. But this really was... The this was the nation. Well, I, I remember this being April or May of 1972. Right. And it was the culmination of something that really had started a year before when President Nixon appointed launched, you. Well, he appointed me. I was yes. part of an effort to, to advance and promote and bring more women into government. And so the results, or the partial results. I call this our show and tell. Are right here. <laughs> because there were. I'm trying to think. We wanted to double the numbers by the end of the year, end of 71, but by this time, which would have been the first quarter of, of uh, 72, we had tripled the number of women mm -hmm. in top jobs. There was something like that. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. Accompanied there was no by stopping Barbara executive women in government, and there was no stopping Barbara Franklin. I, I just think women have arrived. <laughs> and, and I see that in hindsight, the efforts that go back to the early 70s, these efforts, made equality for women legitimate in, in a way that it, and acceptable in a way that it hadn't been before. And that was because a president had put his stamp on it. And from, from that kind of mushrooming, which I think happened in the 70s, the, the lead that government took in this really uh, then extended to the rest of, of our country, from sports to academia to education, uh, you name it. And then I think those gains were consolidated in the 80s, and just more and more women moved everywhere. I think now we're on the threshold of something even bigger, more barriers than, than, than we have ever dreamed are going to be cracked by the time we get to the end of the 90s. I truly believe that women have arrived. That is the bottom line and, and it, will, it will never change and I think it's, it's for the good of the order and the good of our country certainly. The role of women in government was often seen as an auxiliary role, but executive women in government set out to advocate the advancement of women in the social, economic, and political structures of society. Founding member Elizabeth Hanford Dole has worked both in business and in government, serving as Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of Labor, and now as the President of the Red Cross. Well, you know, we felt a need at that time to really relate to one another across government, the women who were in policy-making positions. And executive women in government was designed to provide that networking, which is so crucial even today, 20 years later. Dole has seen a tremendous change in the last 25 years. Well, you know, there has been a, a tidal wave of qualified, talented women coming into the workforce over that period of time. And I think uh, with that influx of talented women has come the need for uh, a balance between family responsibilities and uh, professional responsibilities. Um, certainly, in my years in government, I've seen more and more attention paid uh, to this area. In fact, when I was uh, Secretary of Labor, we had uh, many child care centers across the Department of Labor throughout the country. 
And I think that businesses today are realizing that it's really in their vested interest to be uh, responsive to the needs of women because the workforce is growing at a very slow pace, about 1% a year, uh, slower than the last 40 years. And uh, we expect that slow pace to continue throughout this decade. That means that about uh, two-thirds of the new entrants into the workplace will be women. And uh, certainly, in order to, in, uh, to uh, recruit women and to retain them, employers, government, and private sector are going to have to be responsive to their needs, whether it's child care or flexible benefit packages, uh, flexible work schedules, job sharing, uh, parental leave, uh, being sure that discrimination has been eliminated from the workplace. Uh, that's very important, and it's, a, I think, a, a major change. We've not reached the millennium, but we're making good progress. As president of the Red Cross, Dole oversees an organization that is larger than half the Fortune 500 companies and includes 2,100 active chapters, 2,300 paid staff, and 1,500,000 volunteers. Well, you know, I remember my mother saying uh, that in World War II she was a volunteer for the Red Cross and she said, nothing I ever did made me feel so important. I think to find uh, something which infuses you with a sense of mission, with passion, so that you say, nothing I've ever done made me feel so important. Uh, that opportunity to make a difference for people, I think, is so important. And that's why I would encourage uh, young women to think of government service. Because here's an opportunity to help uh, so many people. Uh, they may not get rich in government service, but they'll enrich the lives of millions of their countrymen and women. For the 10th anniversary of Executive Women in Government, the members were again in the Rose Garden. Led by President Nancy Stewart's EWG paid tribute to the astronauts of the Challenger, the space shuttle's seventh flight. Among the astronauts was the first American woman in space, Sally Ride. Ride opened the door for women to enter the space program. Zero and lift off. planetary science begins as Atlantis clears the tower. When astronaut Mary Clee flew into space, she was not fulfilling a childhood fantasy. Being an astronaut was something I never really thought about uh, at all when I was a little kid, because they were all guys with crew cuts and they flew fast airplanes. In undergraduate school, I wanted to be an airline stewardess, but I was too short, so I went on back into school and became an engineer. She did, however, want to fly. So I started flying when I was uh, 14, and I soloed at 16, and I got my private license at 17, and since I grew up in New York City, I couldn't drive till I was 18. <laughs> so my mother used to drive me to the airport. No one has to drive Cleve these days. While NASA was expanding its space family to include women, on the ground, another old boys network was coming to an end. From its inception, executive women in government had a goal of increasing the number of women in federal judicial jobs. In 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman to sit on the Supreme Court. Well, I became a lawyer uh, back in, in the dark ages um, in 1952. And uh, in those days, uh, law firms were not hiring women. Uh, I went to Stanford Law School in California, and none of the big firms in California had ever hired a woman as a lawyer in those days. And when I graduated, uh, frankly, I was surprised to discover that none of the firms were ready to hire a woman as a lawyer. Uh, in fact, the only job offer I got uh, out of a private firm was being offered a job as a legal secretary. And uh, that isn't really why I had gone to law school. Uh, in those days, jobs in the public sector uh, were more open to women because those were the years when, at least in public employment, there began to be a sense that women were being left out of the picture. And my first job was as a deputy county attorney in San Mateo County, California. And that directed me, really, uh, from the beginning of my career, uh, more into the public sector for employment, uh, which is 
pretty much where I stayed. When I was uh, put on the court in 1981, uh, it was a very exciting moment uh, for women generally to have a woman appointed to the court after so many years in our country. And there was a focus on what I did by the media. Uh, it seemed to follow me where I went. And uh, on a particular case, there would always be stories written about how I had voted and what my opinions were saying. Uh, I was very conscious of that increased attention. And now that we have the second woman on the court, it's a very happy day for me because I think we're going to see more balanced treatment for both of us and for the court in general. Well, the changes that emerged uh, as a result of the efforts in the 60s and the 70s uh, to remove discriminatory laws, uh, these efforts were made by legislative bodies making the corrections themselves, and they were made by the passage of laws prohibiting employment discrimination on the basis of gender. And they were re the result of court decisions. And when you add all that up, we see so many more opportunities for women today than uh, when I got out of school. I mean, the changes in my lifetime are just incredible in that regard. When I went to law school, it was a rare thing for a woman to go to law school. There might be two or three or four women in a law school class. Uh, today, it's more likely to be about 50%. And the changes are dramatic. Uh, we've gone all the way from no women in the United States Supreme Court, for example, to just over 22%. Now, that's pretty impressive. Hey, there goes one of those petticoat soldiers now. Yeah, my sister wants to join the wax. What do you think of that? <laughs> She's crazy. What the devil does a woman want to be a soldier for? Just a waste of time. This is a man's war. What sort of jobs can they do? What sort of jobs can we do? Take a look, mister. X-ray technicians, inspectors of army meat, teachers schooling our soldiers, wax or classification experts, assignment interviewers. So this is a man's war, is it? Wax are at work on every sort of army... The military had always been a man's world until jobs. women like Brigadier Captain General Rocky Myrna Rocky Williamson paved the shoot. way for women in the military. The now the retired, shoot. Williamson is in demand as a war. speaker. Hey, you two armchair generals on the porch, here's something more for you to think about. Listen. Being in the military for 28 years was a marvelous background for what I'm doing now. I'm doing professional speaking and I'm doing business consulting and absolutely loving both. I'm also active in a number of organizations where I feel that I can pay back my community and my country and the people who've supported me over the years. Some people usually perceive that there's a real transition difficulty, I guess, between retiring, going from the military service to the private sector. I certainly didn't experience that. And people ask me, what's the major difference that you see between the two, your, the military life and the private sector life? I would share with you the one thing that I have seen that my peers would agree on. In the private sector, we see a lack of training that we in the military get at every step along the way. You get training, then you have a job. You get the next phase of training, and you're given a job after that. Training, job, training, job. And it's interesting that in civilian life, you meet people who are in high positions of authority who have never been to any leadership classes of any kind, any management classes of any kind, and you see some scared people out there who really just don't know how to interact with people. I think that that's one of the great advantages of having come from a military background is that you have such a wonderful background of training that you do things automatically that many times um, civilian companies have not taught their people to do. I think the new team building concept in America will focus more perhaps upon even the military way of team building. And certainly when you don't think about yourself, but you think about yourself as a member of a team, I think that only the organization and the country benefit from that. 
and certainly the pride that you yourself get from being a member of a successful team is just fantastic. As they embark on their 20th anniversary of executive women in government, the former presidents and founding members gathered to renew their commitment to their goals, to expand the role of women in government, to support other women in their professional pursuits, and to provide an environment for change. I hope none of you think that I live in this robe. I, I, I really believe my lawyers think so, but none of you. Judge Joyce Green, a former president of EWG, administered the oath of office to the new president, Virginia Robinson. While our membership has grown and it has changed throughout the 20 years since the founding of EWG, the real objectives of our being have not changed. We still are here to advocate the advancement of women in the social, economic, and political structure of our society, to support the professional pursuits of women, AKA networking, <laughs> and to encourage participation in public service. We are diverse, just look at us. A true representation professionally and politically of the women in high executive position. As a member of Executive Women in Government, I have had marvelous opportunities to develop new friends and colleagues, and I've developed some networking opportunities that I would not otherwise have had. I've had opportunities to work in areas outside of my field. I've had some opportunities to work in ethics, and I happened to meet some people in EWG who were experts in the field. And that was my opportunity to expand my horizons and really build upon relationships that I had built with EWG members. Among the goals that I have in mind for the year, I, I want to expand our horizons in a number of areas. The number one priority, I hope, will be the manner in which we will expand our education and executive leadership programs. We have a marvelous opportunity in this 20th anniversary year with a new administration in town and just the right time with lots of new members of Congress who are all talking about reinventing government. In our positions, in our respective organizations, we have marvelous opportunities to help with the transformation of government. We are in positions to help with making and implementing policies and practices that can really improve the services to the public, to our taxpayers. This is the time for us to get involved in the changes that are to take place in government and really do our part. And so it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you a very special woman, a role model for all of us, the Honorable Hazel O'Leary. Secretary of Energy Hazel O'Leary echoes the need for the involvement of women. It occurred to me that what we ought to be focusing on is now more than ever an organization like Executive Women in Government. New exposure for women has been a driving force for Executive Women in Government. They provide a regular opportunity to meet and talk with professional women, women who are making policy and news. The women of EWG are in the highest echelons of government. They are both political and career executives in the judicial, legislative, and executive branches, as well as the Foreign Service and the Armed Forces. They are women with high-profile careers, and they are friends and comrades. But supporting the work of other professional women is not enough. In recent years, executive women in government has entered into a partnership with Trinity College, to provide mentors to women who are thinking of making the government a career. Patricia McGuire, president of Trinity College, explains. The partnership between Trinity College and the Executive Women in Government began in the fall of 1992, when I had the great pleasure of meeting Jill Kent, who was then the president of Executive Women in Government, and she was also at that time the chief financial officer of the State Department, and also Mary Matthews, who is in the senior executive service with the U.S. Office of Civil Rights. 
We got together and talked about some of the interests of executive women in government and Trinity College because we were starting our new Trinity Center for Women in Public Policy. We really clicked. These are women who are great leaders, and they exemplified so much of what Trinity College is about, and we agreed to go into partnership at that time. Well, we all know that uh, it has taken the help of women generally to help other women to achieve success. And we've seen this time and time again. We've seen it with the formation of organizations specifically for women, uh, such as the executive women in government, organizations that have undertaken to provide training and encouragement and uh, opportunities for other women, uh, ways in which women can discover that they don't have to be guided by the meager expectations of others for their future. The executive women in government provide a vital link between Trinity's new Center for Women in Public Policy and all of the women who are in leadership positions throughout the federal government. These are some of the nation's most dynamic women leaders, both women we've heard about like Sandra Day O'Connor and Hazel O'Leary, and a lot of women that the general public may never have heard about, but they are the women who make the federal government work. Through the executive women in government, we have opportunities for Trinity students to have a wide array array of internships throughout all of the major federal agencies. In addition, this gives us an opportunity to have these members of the executive women in government come here to Trinity College to participate in special lectures and symposia and all different kinds of colloquia. And they benefit from their relationship with Trinity College as much as we benefit from their relationship with us. But certainly now a mentoring is very important. It's a key role of executive women in government. And um, as I mentioned, Virginia Nauer has been a wonderful mentor to me. I remember when uh, I visited Margaret Chase Smith as a young college graduate, and she was a senator from Maine. She was considered the conscience of the Senate. And she advised me at that uh, time to, uh, to go to law school, to add to my credentials. And uh, she knew that I had an interest in government service. But being willing to have an open door to counsel a young person, well, we believe here at Trinity College that mentoring and internship experiences are vital to the education of the women who participate in our academic programs. Our academic vice president, Dr. Patricia Weitzel O'Neill, is here with me today, and she can comment more on the internship experience. The internship experience at Trinity is something that we have been working uh, with all of our students for years and years and years. But now with the executive women in government, we're looking forward to a more specific relationship with specific agencies, especially through the uh, Center for Women in Public Policy. Three things, network, network, and network. This is really a program that's about establishing and enlarging the old girls network. We've had that at Trinity for many years, but now through our partnership with executive women in government, we're able to take that old get girls network and expand it and enlarge it to include so many more women in the executive service. It's really great and it really works. From its beginning in the White House Rose Garden, through its 10th, 15th and 20th anniversaries, executive women in government is poised to embark on its next 20 years. Its principles and objectives continue to remain the same, to provide opportunity and advancement for women. Tremendous gains have been made, and many more are waiting to be made. With the commitment and support of the members of executive women in government, those gains will continue to be made, changing the faces of government.